What's the more impact that I could have if I had some of my direct reports do something different? And, and I think, you know, that, that's a classic tension, which is when what is right for the business is no longer the exact same thing as what might be right for the individual in that moment. Hello, hello. Hi, Joel. How are you? Excellent. How are you doing today, bud? I'm, I'm great. Um, it's, you know, it's game one of the world series today. And I, I was, I was talking to Jake for a few seconds before, and he's a race fan and I'm a Dodgers fan. So we, we may not be best friends, but uh, I'm always excited about, about the end of a baseball season where I get to root for one of the teams. You guys taking any bets over here pre-show? <laughs> I, uh, no, I, don't, I, I don't, I don't think so. I think I don't want any jinxing or reverse jinxing or anything. So I'm just going to try to live in the moment. Uh, yeah. How, you're not a sports fan, are you? I played sports growing up. So I played baseball for about eight years. I played some football and in high school. And then the one sport that I, I like to watch, uh, like in person is hockey. Oh, very cool. Um, yeah. but you never played, never played hockey. No. How'd you get into it? Like, why do you, why do you like it? Well, one of my business partners took me to a hockey game. And I typically had not liked the, like, I did not like to watch baseball. <clears throat> I enjoyed playing it, but I did not like to watch it. I thought it was just slow. And then when I went to watch hockey, they're all chasing this puck and it's like very fast. There is a lot going on. And so that just for some reason, you know, met the needs of my, my attention span and kept me engaged and watching the whole time. I think it was a, a Buffalo Sabres game was the first game I had ever watched. Okay. Very cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. I miss, uh, as I'm, as I get into my forties, I think the playing of sports is, uh, is becoming more and more dangerous and happening less and less. I always liked, uh, I always loved team sports just cause I think it, it, it like brings a lot of interesting dynamics between people to the forefront over a very short period of time with a really fast, like feedback cycle. Um, and then, yeah, as I've gotten older, I've, I've, I've turned into oddly into a fan, even though I was like you for a long time, I just didn't enjoy watching sports. I enjoyed, I enjoyed playing them, but now I just live vicariously through others. So, so is life. Right. Sports will do that. Raising kids will do that. There's a lot of situations in life that you can put yourself in that give you all sorts of interesting leadership slash life lessons. Yeah. Uh, on the raising kids, I have a one, I have a one-year-old, uh, he's actually, he's, he's 13 months and, uh, uh, yeah, I'm trying not to be a manager with him, but I really see myself like <laughs> thinking of him as someone who reports to me. And I'm like, wow, this is just not the right mental model for this situation. So going back to first principles and figuring out how to be a great dad is, is, uh, is, qu is qu quite a life experience. Really enjoying it. When you watch them like start to walk and fall and get down and overcome those things are, uh, those are good moments. I've got a three-year-old and a one and a half year old. So I'm right, right in there with you, bud. Yeah, I uh, yeah, well, he's developing a personality. So uh, at least he sleeps at night. But it's getting opinions are being are being shared, just not with the human language. So it's a little bit difficult <laughs> to know what's happening. But yeah, I enjoy it. I, I just wonder, you know, you're talking about in, like incentives a little bit, and like trying to think about, like, you know, do I want him? Do I want him to hurt himself walking around, or is it like a kind of hurting that's not good, right? And like the typical manager mindset is like, what are the incentives? Like what? A, what, what will he be optimizing for? And I'm like, what am I thinking about? I just love him. He's my son. Like, let's live life a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. Everyone always has so much advice, whether you're becoming a new manager or becoming a parent. And I've found that like, it's, it's interesting to hear the advice and it can help at times, but there's nothing that can actually walk you through the experience other than going through it. Yeah. Management's interesting. There's no, there's no shortcuts. I think, you know, it's like, you can't condense like 10 years of managing people into a year. I mean, it's, it's just like, you know, you're, you're going to have the, the person who's really, who does amazing work, who doesn't get along with other people in the team. Right. And you're going to, there's different ways to manage that. Right. And it depends on that person's personality. Right. And so there's no generic advice there. Right. It's like, what's the work, what's your relationship with that person? How critical are they? How open are they to feedback? You know, do you, do you draw a hard line in the sand? Do you coach them towards a better working model? Do you isolate them so that they can still do great work without grading on the rest of the team, right? Like there's no, there's no solutions, no advice that's going to help you make that except to 
to do it and see what works for you, how you're good at motivating people and, and so on and so forth. And you need for every kind of management position, you kind of need multiple, multiple times of doing it until you figure out the playbook that's good for you. Right. So, um, yeah, it's like, it's humbling when you think back and you, you look at all the mistakes that you made and, and, and like all the trust that people put in you to figure out these situations when you realize like, oh, I was the first time I dealt with that, you know, and I had to kind of pretend that I knew that I knew a way out that would work for everybody, but that's what makes it exciting. So. And that's why I find that principles are important in play, like where the person's heart is and how they like the lens that they see the world through. When, when you, I, I realized like looking back, like people that invested in me and believed in me earlier when I was too young or now I would say that was, a, that was a silly move. But one of the things that I've come around to see is that they've probably saw some underlying principles in me that, that created that trust that I didn't, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of. Hmm. But at the time it felt natural that they would trust you, right? It's only when you look back that you realize right. kind of, <laughs> we were walking on a plank with not a lot of support. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. I feel, yeah. I, 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 so you just got me thinking about some mentors or some, some people that I had back in the day that, that trusted me with things and then trying to think automatically, am I trusting people on my team enough? You know, am I, do I go internal, right? Or do I go external and look for, for you know, other people? And it's, it's just like a, it's a very interesting, uh, it's a dilemma always. Yeah. The familiarity breeds contempt thing is a difficult, universal law to overcome it's it's pretty it's pretty hard because you as humans in order to make sense of the world we have to you know categorize and organize and put things in boxes at the same time those boxes are always being broken and so it's a it's a constant constant yeah. game I, I plaid right now where engineering is a little bit over you know 200 people so it's like way beyond the size where i i know what anybody's work is right anymore I just don't know, right? I don't know what an individual contributor is working on and so on and so forth. But what's really dangerous is I, I remember when the team was 50 people, right? Just a couple of years ago. And so I have, I have the boxes. I've put the people in the boxes from a, a couple of years ago and those are not the right boxes anymore. People have grown, right? People have new skills there. And so, you know, it's like, uh, uh, I just have to remove myself totally from the process because if anything, if I bring the, the, the data that I bring to the table is very, very stale. Um, that's a lesson that I've, I've learned in my career, you know, where you like, you, you can get in this mindset where you forget how much people can grow, you know, and how much people can learn because there'll be periods where they don't seem like they're learning, right? They've like plateaued and they, they fail at the same thing a few times. And then suddenly, right, like something clicks or they get the right mentorship or the right leader or the right opportunity. And then they uptick, right? And then now they're, they've got a different frontier, a different set of things that they can achieve. Um, but if you don't see that uptick, right? If you're like me, you're too removed from it. You're, it can be quite dangerous to remember them as, as what they were. So I've learned that lesson. I, I, I've, I don't know how to teach it necessarily like to my managers, you know, <laughs> me uh, in all cases, no. right? Like, because it's, I learned it through making mistakes, like underestimating what people could do and then having them maybe be frustrated and leave the team or want to, you know, get a different manager or want to work at a different company. And I, I think over time, you know, I can think of cases where I was too trusting and got burned and in cases where I wasn't trusting enough or didn't believe enough in individuals potential and missed out on, on people who are great. Right. Um, just cause I couldn't create the, the right situation for them to succeed. Um, so. I've been seeing a lot of companies talk about like moving within the organization, moving around to different teams. And we've had that happen here at my company. We're much smaller. We're only like 10, 15 people, but um, that did happen here. And it was really interesting to watch somebody that was like a direct report, go under a new manager and then get different perspective. And then you just, you can learn, you can learn a lot from that. And I've been talking to a lot of different people about how they moved around, uh, throughout their career. And it seems like when the company has the ability to move in within the organization, they tend to stay there and, and move around in different jobs, but when they can't, they tend to go to companies who will see them because the recruiters incentivized financially to be like, you deserve more yeah. and it's time for your next role. And we've got this position over here and, you know, you, you rise to the level of your incompetence type deal and you need to make this career move. 
and it's it's been fascinating for me meeting all these companies and then visiting them and all of that and and seeing the different cultures and how that plays out and like a larger view of the the organization and then the market itself we we've operationalized that so we have like a once you get to 15 to 18 months on a team like your manager is supposed to tell you like hey you really should go do something else it could be you know if you really want to be like an SRE or a backend engineer, maybe it's still within those domains, right? But but just for a different manager, right? Uh, and really try to like promote that. But more often trying to ask someone who's like full stack, be like, do you want to be a little more product engineering? Do you want to work on a different platform? Do you want to go down or up the stack, right? Do you want to work on a team that's experimental b- building quickly versus a team that has like, you know, more of a long-term set of goals and strategic vision that lasts a couple of years, right? Like trying to promote that a lot. What's interesting is even though we promote it, we really have to push sometimes for, for people to move, right? And and I think, but yeah, I think I think you're you're right. It's a, it's a great way to learn, and it's a great way to to keep people at the company. Because the problem is they may not realize when they get stale on something, and when they get stale, their reaction might be to look outside, right? And and you know, I, people are entitled to go work wherever they want to. Obviously, people should do what's best for them and for their careers. But I think in some cases, you know, the company is failing. Uh, people by not providing them an opportunity that matches up with the way they, they could or, or would want to grow. It's that being said, it's much easier when you're going fast, right? Because for me, people can move anywhere because we're hiring so much, right? That I can fill the gaps with new hires. Do you know what I mean? Like if if half of my backend team wanted to do product work, you know, over six to 12 months, I, I could accommodate that because we're hiring enough. I think once you get what I've noticed is like bigger bigger organizations, organizations that don't have as much um, just like headcount growth, where also the roles are more specialized, right? And they need they need like specialists to be successful, right? You can't just put a generalist in a thing and expect the thing to go well anymore. Um, it just naturally the organizations make it structurally more difficult for for people to move, right? Or, or people or, or companies that don't have the same hiring bar across everywhere, where there's you know there's a view that oh they're really good product engineers over there, but maybe not that good like infrastructure engineers. And so then you don't necessarily allow a lot of people to, to move. But I've always worked at companies less fewer than 2000 people. And I think it's always been a matter of pride at, at those places to facilitate the movement. So that, that's really cool that, that you have that even at 15, because generally when you're smaller, right, the, the pressure is just like too many things to build, not enough people like can't afford to even think about about growth and, and providing opportunities, right? So yeah, we just got out of the stage of like trying not to drown. Okay. And now we're in the like, um, in one of the the big takeaways I found from all of that is, and you've been in startups, so you'll get it. Like the chaos is a sign that you haven't figured out what works yet. So you feel like you figured out what works? We figured out what works. Yeah. That, 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 that unique feeling of living through it for a year to two years of like, let's wake up and refocus and try something new and let's like figure it out. And then it finally clicking and then realizing that, okay, now we have something. Now we have to switch our mindset to slow, steady, consistent improvements upon this known model and figure out how to scale it. And that's like a whole different animal. And it's tough because you want to keep that. I'm sure it's, it's, we're experiencing probably similar things, but, you know, at different scales, because you were just talking about, you know, employees and, and, and being able to move them around. And as you go up to the executive team, that becomes a lot harder. Like it's way easier for you to give mobility to some of your entry level engineers rather than your direct report team. It's like, it's so much more work. You have to figure out a new maybe a new role, a new title, a new activity for them or, or some, how do you do that? How do you keep the mobility going with your direct reports? I know you're asking me a tough question. Um, I feel, so I'd plot today, like the reality is I feel fairly lucky that most of my direct reports see themselves doing what they're doing for the next few years. And so I don't feel I don't feel the pressure from them to experience something else. I think they've they've created or I've created with them the roles that they really want that provide them the growth that they want, but also the impact. I think I view it kind of differently. I view it more as what's right for the business, right? What's the what the more impact that I could have if I had some of my direct reports do something different? And and I think 
you know, that, that's a classic tension, which is when what is right for the business is no longer the exact same thing as what might be right for the individual in that moment, or at least how they perceive what they want for their career uh, and what, what, what is the most important like project for the, for the business. I'll give you a micro example, but then I'll go back to my reports, which is like, you know, project management is project management is not the most exciting aspect of what a, a technical lead might do, right? They might be more interested in technical strategy, right? And architecture, those kinds of things. But, you know, if, if you're a tech lead for five or six people working on something like project management, it's like really key, right? There's a, a lot of things happening at once. Um, but you might have trouble over time asking that your more senior engineers who really great at that to do it because they're going to be like, I've done it before, right? But, but you need it for the business because you need really, really good project management. So you know, one thing we've done at Pod always is say, in the short term, we always do what's right for the business. In the long term, we do what's right for your career. And so every time at Pod, I've had to have a conversation, which is like, I need this manager or this tech lead or this IC to do work that's not perfect for them. But it's clearly more important for the business than whatever they're doing at this point in time. People respect it because they know the company looks out for them kind of in the longer term. And so I think if you look at my more senior managers or, or, or my directors, um, right at this moment, I don't have this dilemma, but when I've had it in the past, I've always been able to say like, hey, this team over there, it needs you, or these two managers, like they, they, they need you to help them step up. They need you to do, go and do this thing. Like, and this is why it's right for the business. And people have had the trust that the next decision will be one that aligns both the business and exactly what they want for their career. And I've been lucky, like I haven't had to make long-term decisions that put someone in a role they don't want for you know, 12, 18, 24 months. Cause that's really, really tough, right? And, and sometimes you have to do it. And then you realize actually that person like is not the right person for that role. Not cause they don't have the skills but because it doesn't, it doesn't excite them or it doesn't align with the future that they want. And, and always I think the best managers what they do is someone's great on your team, but they're no long, it's no longer the right thing for their life, right? Your job as a great manager is to be like, hey, I'm gonna help you find a role out there. I'm gonna, I'm, you know, it's like, maybe this is no longer the right company for you. Not because you're not successful, because we just don't have the growth opportunity that you really want, but you're awesome and, and you deserve to find that and let me go out there and, and, and help you get it. And I've done that a few times and actually some of the best leaders I've worked with um, helped me find my next gig. Uh, and, um, yeah, I want to pay that one forward over and over again. So I don't know if that, like, you know, that fully answers it, but it, it's, I think that's the impact mindset that if you have on your team, it makes these things much easier, but you have to have a lot of trust, right? You can't lie to people. You can't tell people like, Hey, go do this thing that you don't really want to do and then leave them there and, and don't fall through six months with the opportunity that matches up their, you know, their, their, their specific needs or their specific wants. Yeah, it comes back to like the character of, of the leader, right? It's why it's so important when you're building an executive team, the people that you have on it, having the same view or the same lens or the same understanding of where you're going. And I'd, I'd read an article you wrote a little bit about talking about putting the you know, mission of the company or the, the purpose of the company ahead of the growth of the individual. And I don't know if I worded that exactly correctly, but could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, okay. So I think, look, um, we're, we're building businesses. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, we are successful as teams and as individuals if we build successful businesses. You might have to solve hard technical problems to do that, hard management problems, hard product problems. But, you know, if you build a great team that works really well, but you're not having end of the day business impact, no one's going to feel really good. Right. So I think behind that for me is like, you, you need people who are really excited about the mission and the impact of the, of the company. And they understand that's the ultimate thing by which success um, is rated. Right. But, and, and that's really important in the moment. That's the short-term, long-term thing. Like short-term, you really want people in that mindset because short-term you always have to make lots of optimizations that are around getting more impact. Right? And if that's tough, if people fight you on that, if people are not aligned with the business impact, it's just, it's just real tough, right? So the perfect example is the person who just wants to work on really hard technical problems. What if you get to a point in your growth where you have no hard technical problems, right? Like you don't really truly have unique hard technical problems, but this person is a great engineer, right? You want them to be able to get like, I get it, this isn't quite as hard, but I can do it faster and better than other people. 
and that's really impactful for the business. So I'm going to go and do it. I'm going to do it really well, really fast. And I'm going to challenge myself, not because it's a hard problem I'm going to challenge myself because I can do it faster than others. Right. That's a great mindset. But sometimes you get that person and you can't adapt their mindset. They're like, nah, I want to work on distributed system, blah, blah, blah. I want to work on. Right. And you're like, ah, we don't need that right now. Right. So that, that's the, that's the part for me where I really want people to internalize the mission and the impact of the business first. But as a leader, right, what's important is long-term, I'm never going to keep that team together and motivated if I don't also give them what they want out of their lives, right? You only get one life on earth, right? We're all going to live like hopefully to 90 or hundred, right? A year is not a lot of time. It's percent of your life, right? If you're going to work a year on something that you don't love, that you don't enjoy, right? Like, as a leader, if I'm going to ask somebody to do that, man, I better the next year after that, give them the perfect thing because it's that person's life and they only get one of them here. Um, and I, I, I talk about that with my teams and, and we have very direct conversations with people when we have to make those trade-offs. And it's, I give a speech to all new managers who join Plaid. Like I give a, tra a training about this, which is like we're optimizing for impact and that's great, but you have, you have to treat your team right in the long term, right? And you also, you know, there's like a, you have a duty with recruiting, right? Don't recruit people with skills that don't match what the business needs, right? Recruit people who do have that impact mindset. If they don't, it's fine. Go work somewhere else. There's plenty of other great, you know, companies in tech. That's the wonderful thing. Um, so I think if you're honest like that about, about the importance of the mission and, but you're also a steward for people's careers, I think as a leader that puts you in a really good place. I'm not saying sometimes you don't have hard decisions, right? It's because sometimes you can't oh, yeah. find the perfect work or whatnot but you're coming to it from a place of like trust and empathy and aligned values around, around the mission and impact. Yeah. And I like how you, you, you were talking about aligning with purpose essentially. So if they're, they are that, that engineer that likes to work on hard problems, but maybe you really, really need them over here to maybe instill good habits within this team. Cause not only do they solve problems, but they happen to be really adept at, at building good habits then them being on that mission with that purpose is, you know, and, and then you showing them that perspective and allowing them to, to see that, that that's very useful. I don't know exactly how to wrap that one up, but it's a useful thing to, to see or to know that that can happen because otherwise you could write it off. You could just say, Oh, they only want to work on hard problems. We're going to have to get rid of them and find someone else. And it's like, you didn't even know it was an option to try to uh, change perspective or show them a different side of the coin. You just, you did a nice little like judo move, right? Because what, you, what you're also talking about is like, you, you kind of want to explain to the person that there are other ways to have impact, other ways to use their skills than in the, the one way that they've conceptualized, which is like, in this case, teaching other people, right? Or getting a team as a whole to embody this set of things that you're already really good at. And that, that's super powerful. I think for me, for me, that comes from someone who really wants to have more impact. Because if they want to have more impact then they think about scaling themselves, right? And then creating culture elsewhere, mentoring others, passing on your skills, right? Or th those are like ways to be more impactful in the industry. So. Yeah. What, what's the big mission for Plaid? Um, we're, 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 we're rewording it right now. So I'm, I have to make sure not to scoop. Uh, uh, we, we need the legacy version. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, the, the short version is we want to make like money easier for everyone in the world. And, and the way we achieve that mission is by making it easier for developers to build apps in the financial system, like FinTech apps. And I think, you know, we're seeing a couple of big trends overall. So obviously there's been a ton of new FinTech companies in the next, in the last like, you know, decade in the United States. And, and most of FinTech is about really uh, risk actually, right? It's about like lending is, is, is about risk. Uh, moving money around is around risk. Like, is that really that person's bank account? Is it, you know, a fraudulent transfer and so on and so forth. Um, giving financial advice is about understanding the goals that people have in, in their life and finding a as least risky way for people to be able to achieve those financial goals, buying a car, buying a house, saving for retirement, putting money aside for your kid. So we want to make all of these kind of risk-based activities easier for consumers, but we don't build the end user experiences at Plaid, right? What we do is we build, we build an integration on top of the financial system so that apps like Venmo or Acorns or Dave or Robinhood can exist, either by making it easier 
for them to move money around using ACH rails or making it easier for them to access someone's like spending history so that they can give them advice or they can issue a loan to them and so on and so forth. That's the mission. And for a lot of it, you know, our focus was on new developers, like tech, tech companies, uh, rethinking the bank, uh, rethinking lending, rethinking how one invests, how one saves. And there's been a lot of really cool companies. What's interesting now, and, and especially with COVID, is we're seeing an acceleration of the innovation going beyond pure fintechs, right? So I think there's like two big things that have happened with COVID. Like one of them is Americans no longer go to their bank branch because it's closed, right? Or if it's open, it's like you have to wait in line and you also you don't want to be close to others. So what, what, I, what, is, what that has caused is actually like even more traditional players in the financial space have to be uh, much more like digital uh, and, and virtual in their in how they deliver financial services. Uh, and so like there's like really incredible statistics, like 60% of Americans use more fintech now than they did in January. Like for 70% of people in the US, like, like fintech over an app has been like a lifeline. Uh, and like three quarters of Americans see it as like a, the new normal, meaning they might still go to a, a branch for stuff, but there's a bunch of stuff that they used to go to a branch for that they don't anymore. So you know, COVID is, is, is terrible, right? But just from the lens of, of fintech, it's just accelerated, not just innovation by fintechs, but it's accelerated traditional players also having to adapt their experiences. And then the second thing that's happened is the, the PPP, like the, the, uh, the, the federal kind of program to help protect people's paychecks, right? Um, and so the way that was done is basically through loans to businesses, but those loans couldn't happen in person. They also had, had to happen digitally. And it was like a, a large a hundred plus billion dollar amount of, of money and loans that had to be issued. And so the way that worked is actually like, you, you know, all, all the traditional banks that had relationships with businesses had to figure out a way to, to issue these virtually. So it, it's not just on the consumer behavior side, but also the banks themselves had like this one event that forced them to collaborate more with fintechs, figure out how to be digital. Um, and so I think we're going to come out of this with, I don't know, three, five year acceleration in the rate of, uh, fintech penetration in the US, which has been like really fascinating. So for us, the mission now, it, you know, it's, a, it's not just like in, in your garage, right? Uh, uh, he and she engineers like doing a new startup. It's also how do you work better with established financial players? How do you look at even like non, non typical financial players like uh, car dealerships that are that want to issue credit when you're buying a car? Like, how do you think beyond uh, pure finance as the set of players that may want to build uh, better financial experiences for, for consumers. So that's, it's a pretty exciting mission. It has a lot of, as exciting as it is, it has a lot of unknowns, right? So it's, it's almost too many, too many directions to go into. And so you, you know, it's too much choice when you're small is scary because you don't, you don't have the team to do all the things. So that's, that's kind of where we struggle with today. It can be. Yeah. One of the most, the hardest moments of my life was when I realized that I could do pretty much anything after I used to be not a great person and then decided to start working hard and become a great person and just change my entire life over the past 10 years. And then I, then I was actually faced with this moment of, whoa, you know, it was, it was with this podcast where I thought this would take me 10 years and maybe I would get to the point where like I could make a paycheck or build relationships and lead another company through the podcast or something like that. And when it, when I looked back and we're like three years and we're cash flow positive and I'm like, I had this moment where I was, I was like, Oh no, I didn't pick my next thing. And, and then I started thinking, Oh wow. Well, I saw how much hard work it takes to do something. And I realized I could just chew out like, like, like block off the next decade and do anything I want. And then that opened up this world of possibilities which sent me like spiraling. And then I'm like, Oh man, that's a, that's a tough thing. Right. It's like when the, when you like win the lottery or something, you kind of go crazy because you don't have the skills to handle it. And so then I had to develop skills and that was, it was so great. And like, so such a synchronous moment too. When I, right when I had that problem, I had a platform and a stream of great bright people coming through that could help me through that. So I talked it out. I talked it through like a lot of the different episodes and bounce ideas off of people. And I was, I was very excited when I heard that you were coming on the show and with the plaid and partly because, so the way I got the money 
really like the bulk of the money to start this was me selling my interest in a fintech company that I had. And this problem was like the big thing that was the hardest part of the project because we did financial analysis across their entire portfolio with like withdrawal strategies and tax strategies. And we basically just made, I, I'm, there's many other players out there in the market, but we did it specifically against this one like style of financial modeling. And in the, in the process of that, we had this trouble getting access to these bank accounts and this financial data that we needed. And we ended up building it ourselves. And so that, ended up, and I actually, that was one of my first extractions from the monolith was the service for connecting to all these accounts. And then we ended up having to hire a team of people because they always change and half of them had APIs and the others you were scraping. And some of them even had to go download a PDF and then extract from the PDF. And it, it was, it was such a complicated, like such an orchestration. Uh, I just like really understand the type of problems you guys are solving over there. <laughs> And I've loved how the industry has matured because this was seven or eight years ago. Um, but you guys, how long have you been around? You've been around at least seven years, right? Well, I've been I've been at Plat four. You know, I was I was a job box before that for about four years. But by the way, you've just described like when I joined Plat four years ago, you like literally just described the company. Yeah, like those, those, that's what that's what we were doing. That's that was those were the tough problems, right? Like the N plus one bank that doesn't have APIs or has data that's organized totally different than somebody else. Like, how do you, how do you get that? How do you clean it? How do you make it easy for developers to work with? And I, I think it's better now than it was, but I, you know, I, it feels like it could just still be so much better. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's not a solved problem. You know, um, uh, banks are still moving to, to digital platforms. They're still figuring out how to write APIs. Um, they're figuring out how to make, um, their data more, more synchronous. Like think about a bank that updates their website once a day, right? Like you may, you can use that credit card during the day, but it's, it's not on the, the live data of your spending during the day is just not available anywhere. Right? Like that's not a great experience. It doesn't matter how good plot is there, right? At the end of the day, you're not getting live data. And so if someone's building a fraud model on top of that data and it's not, you know, it's delayed 24 hours. Well, that's not going to be the world's best fraud model, right? That's just the reality of it. So, you know, I think there's, it's much, much better than it was three to four years. And, and I think we built a lot of good technical foundation. We're, you know, partnering with banks to, to make it better, like daily, weekly. <clears throat> but I think we're still a few years away from it being what, what it needs to be, I think, for consumers, <clears throat> sorry, for consumers to be, to be able to have third party financial experiences that are as good as what they can get from, from their, you know, core bank or whatnot. That's awesome. I didn't realize that you like literally described the business, you know? You're yeah, I went through it. We, <laughs> it was a lot of work and, and it was very successful. And my business partner actually it helped him grow his business so fast and so efficiently because we basically just automated a job that was like a very, the most expensive expense he had was coming up with these financial reports and the analysts he would have to hire. And he expanded from one location to five location in two or three years. And then he said, Hey, and I was getting a little frustrated saying, Hey, you know, our agreement was I come shadow you for three years, understand how your business works, build this software to automate the hardest thing for you. And then we go take it to market. And he's like, it, it was so profitable for him and his business. He didn't want competitors to, to have it. And so he said, uh, he, he offered to buy me out and I accepted the offer and then used the money to, to start the podcast. Very cool. Yeah, it's uh the the founding story of Plaid is is kind of similar actually. They you know the, the William and Zach built they built the integrations for, for themselves because they were building an app to to give financial advice and because they were out here in Silicon Valley they they were like in this in this group of other people who were starting like fintech companies some of, some of the ones that are kind of pretty big now and everyone wanted to access the data. And so they had this insight, well, if everyone wants to do this, like, why don't we build a service around it? But initially it looked like it was gonna be really small because there just weren't that many FinTechs, right? It's one of those things where you're, you're our luck, I don't know is the right word, but it's serendipitously, you've got, you're, 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 you have the shovels for a thing that will be like a, a huge cave system, right? And you just don't know that at first. I don't, at first people are just building like small little holes and you're like, oh, I'll make a hundred thousand dollars by selling on the shovel. And um, yeah, it's worked out. It's worked out really well. Um, so, because there was no one doing it. like seven years ago, it was like Intuit and maybe Yodly 
like had you know had yep. some version of this, but it was like you know Intuit closed their API, and then Yodli, um, you know Yodli, you had to pay them like a huge amount of money just to get started, and so it just wasn't accessible to startups or to people who were on a budget. You had to do it like you did, right? Like you had to build it in house. I haven't heard that name in a long time. You would, yeah, they, uh, <laughs> yeah, they, we couldn't use them because it didn't fit in our thing. You know, it was me and and my business partner Robert, and he owned a financial advisory firm that was already in existence, and uh, we needed something. And and I like how that was interesting how you said that because it was the same thing for us. Like this was not the product. This was this necessary thing that we had to do in order to run the calculations that we needed to run at this, you know, speed and, and user experience. And then pricing came into it and all, all of these different aspects. And I, I believe at the very, I can't remember, but I believe at the very end, we ended up using Plaid. I'll have to talk to the other engineer, Kevin, but like, I think at the very end, we ended up using Plaid for like 80% of the accounts. And then the ones that we couldn't get at the time. Uh, very like specialty ones that were different types of financial products. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of drawing a blank right now, but um, these like type of insurance products you would buy these insurance thing and they would do guaranteed payouts over the course of like 20 years. But uh, we, we had to use the PDF extraction technology and the screen scraping because these companies didn't even have APIs at all. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. So when you were talking about the PPP stuff, man, did that resonate with me? Cause we, we did our, um, protection thing. And, uh, at the time, Wells Fargo, like who's our, who's like our main, main bank, uh, they weren't accepting the applications. It took everyone like so much time to understand and read. And that's just the nature of it. And I understand, but we had a local regional bank that was, you know, recommended to us through our VC and we used them. And so I opened an account there and we applied and we got the money, but oh my goodness was, it was like stepping back and like the eighties with the technology. I was like, these banks exist and they, yeah, they have 15, 20 locations. And I, I, it's like, it's like almost unusable the way that these mega banks have advanced the technology so far and you become so accustomed, accustomed to them. These local regional banks that are, are it, it's like, well, it's just an entirely different experience. So we see this a lot, right? It's like there's, I, I don't wake up every morning and, and necessarily, you know, tap, tap myself on the shoulder for like the, like the great positive morality of, of what we do at Plaid. But like one thing that I'm, that I'm quite cognizant of is like, it's actually hard for smaller banks and mid-sized banks, like regional banks to compete with national players because technology is becoming such a big part of what you need to, to be great at as a bank to, for your consumers, right? And so there's, you know, there's like eight plus thousand financial institutions in the US, right? And credit unions, by the way, in the US are awesome, right? They're like, from a, from a, from a consumer perspective, from a community perspective, from a profit motive, for, they're wonderful. The problem with the credit union is they're not gonna be able to hire world-class engineers, right? A lot of them are small. They don't have, they just don't have the budget to do it. So I think for us, like we, we view what we call it kind of the long tail of financial institutions as something that we need to serve really well, because I think those institutions are very important, like locally, right? They, they support communities, right? So if Plaid doesn't support uh, a, a bank in a certain community and there's users of that bank that want to get, they want to use Acorns or they want to use Square Cash or whatnot, and they can't like, it's kind of our responsibility to, to make sure that, that that bank exists. So that's like one, that's one aspect of it. The good thing is a, a lot of the, there, there, are, there are companies that provide banking platforms for the long tail as well. And I think those companies are more and more sophisticated and I think are actually going to lead to pretty good competition on the, on the consumer experience around financial services, like even for those smaller institutions. But, you know, it's, it's been interesting, like we had, you know, with, with uh, Black Lives Matter and the movement, like one thing that we did internally and ask ourselves, so the, the way traditionally we weigh which banks to, to integrate with is based on expected traffic volume, right? Right. So there's 8,000 institutions. It takes a significant amount of effort to integrate with them, right? Like look at how many people work with an institution who are trying to use apps and use that as the guiding principle of where you spend engineering and support energy. Um, right. But another perspective, you could have it like, well, you know, there's like some moral duty to support banks in communities that are underbanked or communities that are totally unbanked. Right. 
um, or to support apps that are aiming to provide better financial services for, for immigrants, right? Or like create synthetic credit score equivalents for, for people who move to the US and don't have any credit history. And so I think that's something we've like, we've always asked ourselves and I think we've been much more conscious about uh, this year because of just, you know, the COVID crisis does not affect everybody in the United States evenly. And, and you know, as someone, you know, as I said, we take pride in helping to create the future, but you have to ask yourself if the ways in which you create the future uh, advantage or disadvantage like certain groups in the country. So, you know, I think we're like much more aware of credit unions, smaller community banks and, and you know, that we maybe traditionally like, like we're aware of, but now we're like, hey, like we have to make the data quality for those institutions as good as it is, you know, for Chase or for Wells Fargo, because they operate in areas where Chase and Wells Fargo don't. And that's, that's good. That's good for, for everybody. Yeah. It, we, I just wanted to send them an email and say, Hey, could you guys invest in your UX? Cause it doesn't have to be ugly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. I'll move on. I'll move on. I just the, one of the things that I remember about you guys is how beautiful your your interface were. Like the first time I saw it, I remember like screenshotting the the process and then coming up with some wireframes and mockups to rework ours because the just at the time the design. If you look at it now, that version would probably look old, but at the time it was like so modern and. Uh, I actually use, I noticed I was using Plaid the other day when I did a, like an application online and I was like, yes, it's like, they're keeping up with it. It's still an amazing design. It was amazing years ago when I first met them, but you, you, when you were just talking just now, you mentioned something, you talked about underbanked people. So like, I understand not having a bank account. Right. And I understand having a bank account, but what are underbanked people? Um, well, I mean, like one, one example would be you've got a bank account but no one will give you a credit card. And so you only use debit. And so you're not able to build any credit scoring. And so then you need a loan and you can't get a loan, right? And just because of the way the credit system works in the United States, right? Just about everybody looks at, looks at credit score, but you just, you just don't have, credit. what do you do then, right? So that would be someone that, that would be, um, that would be underbanked. There's some, there's some really cool companies out there that are doing things. So for example, like in a, in the mortgage, uh, in the mortgage space, there's like a company called uh, Better, which is like uh, kind of in the mortgage lending space. And what, what they're trying to do is look at different metrics to remove bias from the process of approving someone for a loan, right? And so I think, you know, the, the business is like there's people who might not be able to get a loan or be able to not get as good terms on a, on a, on a mortgage who should be able to. Because if you look at the data of how they spend money, even if it's just debit or whatnot, right, they, they would qualify. Or you have, um, so it's like, it's like one area. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of cool apps out there. Like one I think that I like is Grain uh, Technologies that, that basically gives you something that kind of looks like debit, but actually builds like a credit score for you um, um, with like very low rates, right? As a way for someone to build enough credit that they can then use um, other services. That's one example. Another example would just be like a, um, I mean, look, th there's places in the U.S. where there are fewer banks, uh, where local banks don't offer even certain services to um, to people there. There's like a, like a, a good a good example of small businesses. So you know, look at uh, if you're a small business and you're you need to finance your inventory, right? But you started as like a sole proprietorship you maybe they don't have a great credit score. How do you fund buying your next inventory so that you can sell more stuff, right? So if you look at like Shopify, right? They've, they're, they're starting um, to look at like merchant trajectory in terms of past sales, but also other, other aspects of that solo entrepreneur or solo proprietors like spending history to decide whether they'll, they'll help fund uh, like ongoing business, right? And that's an area before you kind of might've been like shit out of luck there. Right, like your local bank might not have been willing to look um, beyond a few things and might have evaluated you like very different businesses than what someone solo in a disadvantaged community is, is, is gonna start. And then just credit overall is not available evenly in the United States, right? Even if there's a bank in a community, it might have only a certain number of amount of lending that it can do, right? Uh, because it's a community bank. And so once that's tapped out and used, like, if you're there and trying to start something and there's no other financial institution covering you, like, what do you do? So there's like just a, a ton of, a, a, a ton of this. And by the way, unbanked and underbanked in the U S like 25% of the population, right? 
So, so it's just a lot of people and it's an opportunity, by the way. I, like, I think it's not like, I think if you're a, a larger financial institution, it's not like you don't want to serve people because if it's ROI positive, you want to do it. You just might not be capable of doing it or the system is, is set up in a way that you don't have the data or you can't make a lending decision based on a, a separate set of factors because you're just not equipped to do that, right? So I, I think a lot of the FinTech innovation is, is initially small new companies doing it differently but what I'm really hopeful is that then you see that stuff be mainstream, right? And you don't have to have a, one of the new companies win. You can have other existing players copy, like in a positive way, right? Some of this fintech innovation and make it available to everybody. But I was like really long. I'm very long-winded, as you have noticed. But well, but luck, yeah. luckily you're on a talk show, so yeah. <laughs> is that how it works? It <laughs> you're works. You're like uh, you're very conversational. It's one thing I liked from a few episodes. I I, I like how conversational you are. Oh, thank you. Did you check out the Shopify episode? I did not. I haven't checked out the Shopify episode. Uh, I, I, I checked out um, uh, the PayPal episode. Uh, oh, yeah. Quite liked. And then I listened to one with the CTO at GitHub talking about like these like three timelines of kind of innovation and, 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 and building a, like kind of a CTO office that's kind of an innovation or skunk works uh, uh, unit. I thought those two were interesting. Yeah. No, his horizon one, two, and three thing. I was like, clip that. That's like the, you know, we always look for like the one gem in the episode and we're like, yep, there it is. I hadn't heard that before. And I love the way that, that he articulated it. It was good. He, Jason's awesome, man. Yeah, it was a great episode. So, so what, what's like really on your mind right now? Like, what are you really excited about at Plaid? Uh, what am I really excited about? Um, well, right now, 20, 2021 planning's on my mind. Yeah, I've got some spreadsheets with headcount plans and budget and uh, all that kind of stuff, but I don't think that's really good material for, for this podcast. One, I think, one thing that I'm thinking about for next year for us specifically is um, privacy engineering. Um, so I don't, this isn't, this isn't polished. So you're just gonna, I'm gonna give you raw stuff and you can push back and make me feel stupid. That's totally fine. So perfect. People build bridges, right? Like we build bridges. And generally when I drive over a bridge, I'm like pretty sure that it's not gonna fall apart and break, right? But back in the day, people used to build bridges and sometimes they fell, right? Or they broke or whatnot. But now we build bridges that last like 50, 100, 200 years and we know how to maintain them and, and the reason is we've learned lessons, right? We've learned like how you build a bridge, the materials that you use, the, you need ways to like maintain, like all this stuff. It's, it's, it's part of this discipline called civil engineering. Great. If architects, civil engineers, they work together. You can't trust one civil engineering firm. So you always have another firm, double check the work to make sure you're not putting too much load on things, right? All this stuff, when the materials come in, you inspect them, you might have different like providers to make sure you have competition on the quality, like all this stuff exists, right? Great. So we're good at building bridges. Wonderful. Now they're very expensive to bridge, to build, right? And they take a long time to bridge and you have all this permitting and all this stuff that makes it heavy. So my mindset is like in, in, the, in the world of engineering for computers, right? We're like, you know, we're like in the third century AD right now. Maybe not even, I don't know, maybe we're like pre-Roman, right? Um, like we kind of understand the things that we have to do, but we don't, I don't think we have like true discipline around what best practices are around every little bit of area of engineering. So I think for reliability and uptime, there's now, there's a cabal of people who've worked at companies that have really high scale who understand it. If you're going to work on a high scale system, there's 10,000, 20,000 engineers in the world that have enough expertise that you can like build something that runs at like five nines or six nines, like it, it exists, right? One area where I think we're very nascent and it, it both scares me and excites me is around privacy uh, and privacy engineering. Um, just simple things like data deletion, right? Like, okay, you get data, you create, you, you know, you use your data, you use it to build products, great. Like what, what, is, what are good data deletion practices? And not just like deleting the initial data, but de deleting that data in your monitoring system, in your logging system, in your tracing system. What about derived data? What about derived data that you can use to reconstruct the initial data? What about derived data that's truly anonymized that you can't even tie back to the initial data point, right? There's this like long stream. And I think right now we build systems that are good at getting insights, but I don't think we have the privacy aspect really well defined, which is like, what's a responsibility 
towards our users, towards uh, data that we have? What about reselling data? Do you, can you resell the original data? Can you resell the anonymized data? Can you not resell any of it? Like, do you bury things in your terms of service? Are you really clear with your users about what you do with your data? There's like this really long range of, of questions. It's not super answered. It's kind of getting answered in the ad tech space. Uh, you know, like there's been a lot of retargeting and selling and people have had kind of weird experiences online, right? When like an ad appears somewhere where you don't expect it to. And so now there's some companies in, in the ad tech space who I think have much more, much better privacy practices. Like Snapchat actually comes to mind as a company that's very privacy forward, like and around how they think about ads. And that's great. But again, we don't have best practices. In FinTech, it's the, you know, for us, it's, it's the same way. Like Plaid has always said, we don't sell data to anybody else. Like, right, just like, just we don't sell data, right? We just don't provide it to any third parties. We're like, we're a pipe. We're a pipe from A to the app that you use. We feel really strongly about that. We also put restrictions in our developer terms about what the developers who build on tap on, on, on Plaid can do with the data. But we're, we're coming to this from like really good intent, right? And, and obviously there's regulation that may be passed and we're like, you know, we're talking to a lot of people to try to define what are best privacy practices for FinTech, right? But for me, it's like a frontier. So it's something I'm excited about because I think so many companies use us that I think we have a, a huge opportunity to set a really high bar for what best privacy practices are in fintech it's also kind of self-serving because we think competitors to plat actually have not good privacy services uh sorry policies and 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 and, and kind of might have sold data in the past or maybe selling data now so i think i feel good about where we are right but i, I think i'm really excited by the opportunity to kind of define what best in class privacy engineering is like and i think i think if you look at companies that build things 10 years from now um, I think there, it will be clear what you're supposed to do uh, towards consumers. I think there'll be a set of best practices that exist, m much like we're seeing kind of around, as I said, distributed systems and, and, and building high reliability systems. So that's something I'm really excited about, but I think it's still wrapping my head around it, right? Something with my security and privacy team, we're spending a lot of time talking about with policy and, and trying to understand like what it looks like. Because if you look at GDPR, right, you look at regulation like across the world, it's, it's also nascent. And I think the danger always of, of, of the regulatory aspect is like, what if it brings you to, to an area which really scuttles innovation, right? So I think for us, it's like really important. Like, how do you, how do you work with the government, with regulators? How do you work with like consumer protection groups? How do you do something that leads to like great privacy, but also still the ability for people to build better experiences and, and innovate? That's the, it's rantish, but I get excited about that. It's weird to say I'm excited about privacy. If you'd asked me like four years ago when I left Dropbox, would I be excited about privacy engineering? I would have been like, I, I don't, I don't understand, you know, just store the data encrypted. We're done. Life is great. But I, I think I have a much more subtle understanding of, of that stuff. Right. So. Yeah. And well, you're seeing that it's becoming more important. I'm seeing that it's more important. I'm also seeing like, you know, we're all seeing how it can be dangerous this year. Right. Um, and so I feel a lot more responsibility towards at least in the financial space, making sure it's, it's, it's broadly good, right? Not just good to make money. Yeah, because it's one thing, there's the expectation that I'm being tracked on the internet just because I build this stuff, right? And understand how the marketing and all these tech, ad technologies work. And so that's cool, but it would, like talking about something and knowing that like the Facebook app is listening to the microphone and then seeing an ad about, okay, that doesn't, like nothing special there right but if i started seeing ads based off of bank account purchases that like weren't connected and the only way for them to have known this information would be to be hooked into my bank account purchases that would be for me that's like at least today because it's like frog and boiling water deal for me today that would be like unacceptable yeah i mean that's way above the line like we're like like that's like nowhere even close to where the world is, thank God. But yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> for sure. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's one that I've always asked myself, like just, can you, what can you do to delete all of the data that's out there about you? So you wanted to, right? You can ask Google to delete it, but who else, who else had access to it along the way? What are they doing with it? It's like the downstream effects are almost what's more scary than the initial actors. It's, you know, it's kind of like, after it's been handed off once, how many more times is it handed off? So that's why for us, like we just don't hand it to anybody because you can't 
can't trust anybody except the one app that that user wants to use. But um, yeah, it's a complicated world. It is because at the same time, all the engineers or all the engineers I've met, or at least on the surface, and this whole theme of this whole industry has been since I've been a part of it since you know age eight has been let's just build cool stuff to help people, and so that's like where most people's heart is there, and so that's how I, you know, deal with the the stress of you know these conversations. Like I watch a social dilemma and I'll start to get stressed out, and then I kind of just have to back up and be like, all right, I need some faith that we're all really good humans and. 99% of the people I interact with in life are good with good intentions. And so let's, let's just use that as the model of the world and know that it's not going to be perfect today, but things are going to get better. And we're definitely like, we are making so many advances. Like we, we didn't get electricity until like 110 years ago. And look at the, look what we're at today. I mean, this is crazy. You, you have to, the, the, I think people can all be good, but you can still have unintended consequences oh, of course. that you worry about, right? So it's like, I, I mean, when I was at Platt and it was, you know, like fewer than 20 engineers, like security and privacy were a core part of what we did, right? And like, if we had some engineers that, yeah, we're moving fast and building things to help people, but they had to run things by security and privacy. Like, yeah, you had to, like, you just, you know, cause we were from the beginning for us, it's like, we, we cannot get this wrong. Like you just cannot get this wrong. You have to get this right as a company from the beginning. You cannot like one instance of it going bad is the end of the business, right? And and that's a different mindset. That's not the mindset that uh, some companies that I've worked on in the past was, even though some of the data that they had might've been really sensitive, right? Just because you didn't think about it. I think now people are much more conscious of these things. I just think the, the best practices are not super well-defined, but yeah. Also, do you think we're still in a moment where, because I, I feel like we're in a moment that's more negative about Silicon Valley. Like I think the, you know, the veil of like, we're good people trying to make things better is um, I think hasn't proven to be as true, right? Like factually for the world. Right? I, I look at us as a global technology community because that's my perspective talking to people all over the world. So when I say that, I, I mean like technologist in general, like if there was, you know, you look at all the humans, like that person's a technologist, the majority of people I'm running into, they just, we're kind of geeks and we think it's cool to build stuff that helps other people. Yeah. But yes, San Francisco is having a hard time right now in the press, my friend, because <laughs> some of the companies and the, the costs and all that stuff, but you know what, it'll all come back around. It'll work itself out. Things will get good again. It's just how it always goes. There's always ebbs and flows, you know? Like when we were cave people, we used to see the sun going down and thinking the world was going to end until it came back up the next morning. I watched the Groods this weekend with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We have to learn. There are lessons to be learned. You know what I mean? It's like that. And that's the important part. I think if if you if you open your eyes and you, you're you willing to learn the lessons, then yeah, the the... The sun will shine again. And actually, it's by the way, fascinating. Like, I'm sorry that I use Silicon Valley language because you know my my whole team is like sp splintering and, and and people are moving to all sorts of places in the United States and beyond. But I think really exciting thing about this year, right, is I think the next generation of companies are much more global and international because of what's happening than Silicon Valley, right? And Silicon Valley is an eco chamber, lots of positive things, lots of you know funding and 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 really people pushing their ideas to their limit, but. Um, I'm excited to see people who haven't been here uh, show everybody that you can build better companies elsewhere. Uh, you know, we talked about Shopify a little bit before, but like a perfect example of like an amazing business that just doesn't have much to do with, with this little corner of the world, thankfully. Yeah. And you've been all over the world. That was actually like my first, one of my first notes was to talk about all of the different places you've lived and very exciting. I know what we're coming up here. It's already, it's like, three after two here. And so I want to be respectful of your time, but you are a person that I very much enjoy talking to and you have an open invitation to come back on the show. You know, maybe next year you can come back on, we can catch up and talk more about leadership and what we're learning and life and stuff. Cause I, I really enjoy talking with you. Yeah. Joel, anytime. Uh, yeah. It was, it was a really good chat and uh, yeah. Why don't we, let's do it 12 months from now. The world will still be here and we'll have more interesting things to, to discuss. Awesome. Thank you so much, my friend. Have a great day. Bye, Joel. Take care.